So uh, our next uh, speaker, as, uh, as uh, uh, Mark mentioned in the introduction, uh, this is the first year in which we've had uh, a, uh, a speaker for a second time. And um, uh, this is our first example. Uh, uh, Jan Vetcher uh, has been a professor of quantitative finance uh, at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management in Germany uh, since uh, 2010. And uh, prior to that, he, for 10 years, he was on the faculty at the Department of Statistics at uh, Columbia University. And um, he's got a book uh, that he's trying to finish up. Uh, I uh, know what that's like. Um, uh, a book on uh, soccer metrics. So uh, be looking for that uh, coming to a bookstore near you soon. Um, and uh, Jan uh, spoke at, at our very first Nessus uh, about uh, the, the, the topic of his talk back then was excitement. And uh, his, uh, his talk spurred enough excitement that uh, we wanted him back again. So, Jan. Yes, so thank you for organizing this event, inviting me. Thank you, Mark and Scott, for this uh, conference, in fact. And um, yes, I'm the two-time speaker, actually. So it feels like winning an Oscar twice. <laughs> but uh, the first time I had more hair, so you, you can count me as two people. Uh, well, this time I, I want to talk about uh, crossing in soccer, or soccer as a sport in general. And um, there is some logic behind it, which is that uh, soccer is arguably the most popular sport in the world, except in the US. So uh, you know, this is somehow bizarre coincidence that uh, I actually present this talk in, in the US. Uh, but uh, the, there is another thing, which is that in the US, uh, statistics has been actually valued in terms of solving, for instance, baseball. Okay, so, so, so there is a certain com there is a, a strong community of um, scientists and professionals who appreciate that. So uh, I hope that um, you know, somehow this is uh, an opportunity to, to show that this uh, statistics, in fact, has a potential in other sports, such as in soccer. And uh, there is a sub part of it, which is that just one uh, piece in soccer ha is, is bad, which is crossing. And uh, I will show you uh, on the data from the English Premier League and the German Bundesliga that this is really a bad idea to do, in fact. And uh, let me introduce what uh, I'm going to talk here. So uh, about 15% of all goals scored in the English Premier uh, League are the results of open crosses. But the mm, open play cross is actually a, an aerial delivery of a ball into the penalty area. And uh, crossing from an open play is hugely inefficient. It turns out that only one open cross, roughly out of 92, leads to a goal. And uh, this is possible to put it into the model, estimate the impact of uh, crossing on scoring. And it turns out that the ne net effect of crossing is typically negative or neutral at best. And uh, if one takes uh, sort of the difference between the projected scoring rate uh, uh, and the actual scoring rate, uh, one can argue that uh, there could be additional significant number of goals scored per game if the teams uh, reduce scoring, uh, crossing. Sorry. Uh, it turns out that the quality of the team is the major explanatory factor on the number of such missed opportunities. And the stronger teams miss more goal opportunities in general when crossing than weaker teams. Uh, the stronger teams have more options how to score, and open play crossing seems as one of the suboptimal ways of goal creation. And in English Premiership, at least, there are six teams that could, want, that could win the league. Uh, they are namely Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City, or Tottenham. Uh, all these teams could, you know, are projected to win the league if they just stopped doing open crossing. Uh, you know, without hiring any new players, in fact. Uh, there is another team, which is Manchester United, which is a single exception because the op open crossing doesn't affect them. So, so that uh, means that this would be the sixth team that could win it. Uh, 
a, a reverse picture is seen in the defensive analysis. Uh, it turns out that more goal opportunities are missed in general when crossing against weak teams than crossing against strong teams. And uh, it's kind of interesting that the actual conversion of open crosses to goals plays only a minor role for explaining the impact of open crossing on goals. So this is uh, roughly the summary of the talk what is coming up. The, uh, how did I got into it? In fact, I have... Uh, I'm sort of uh, n not a, a major soccer fan, in fact, but uh, Scott uh, said that uh, you know, my background is in finance. And uh, the thing is that in Europe, uh, there is a major uh, betting market that trades all these betting contracts on each individual game. And the betting market trades events such as win, draw, loss, and in a given game, you have additional contracts. For instance, total number of goals, uh, exact score, or team to score next, no goal event, and so on. And uh, these contracts can be regarded as pure financial contracts in some sense, but they are driven by goals. And goals tend to be somehow Poisson distributed. So, technically speaking, this is a, a perfect example of financial contracts that are driven by chumps. Uh, on the you know, traditional financial markets are, uh, in fact, driven by uh, diffusions or Brownian motion. And so this, uh, so my original interest was into, uh, you know, what is, com what is similar between these two types of financial products. And um, it turns out that, indeed, a reasonable approximation of the dynamics of the soccer score is a Poisson process for the goal distribution. So the goal score in the rem uh, remainder of the game uh, would follow the Poisson distribution. So uh, this could be taken at any time, in fact, at, in the game. OK. Uh, yeah, so you can think that this is the score at time uh, T in the game, and this is the score in the final game, so this is the distribution of the rem remainder of, you know, of, of, of goals to be scored. So this should be a Poisson distributed for some parameter lambda T, so this is also a function of T. And uh, for the home team and for the away team, you uh, have a similar distribution with the exception that I call this uh, parameter mu. And so you can think about these as scoring intensities for the two teams. Uh, which is expected number of goals to be scored in the remainder of the match. Uh, and uh, there is one simplifying assumption, which is if we assume that these uh, scores are independent, then we can compute all these, prob uh, all these uh, values for such contracts, uh, where parameters lambda t and mu t serve as, as inputs. Well, uh, is it true that, the, that soccer is... Poisson distributed, well, to a certain degree, yes, uh, but there are no limitations. So first limitation is the scores are not really independent. So the real, the, the observed correlation of the score in the English Premiership since uh, 2006 is minus 0 0.057, which is a reasonably small number, but it's negative and it's statistically significant. So you cannot really dismiss the idea that there are uh, independent, so actually it fails the test for independence. So there is some information going on. Uh, for modeling purposes, this is extremely difficult to model two Poisson distributions with negative correlation. So it's, it's, it's a headache. Um, you know, as opposed to Poisson with positive correlation. Uh, there is also some memory in goals, but this effect is reasonably small. In fact, there is a nice contract, at least from the probabilistic point of view, which trades next goal. And the uh, probability that a next goal is scored by a, a particular team should stay the same before and after the goal if there is no memory in it, so in the system. So actually, there is at least a, a very nice and clean a contract that could let you test it. And this is true to a certain degree. 
the uh, well in finance what you can do is once you have the theoretical prices uh, you can imply uh, the underlying parameters for instance if you have a, a stock option uh, the stock option depends on volatility and this volatility can be implied from the prices and these are called implied volatilities okay and there is a similar concept in uh, betting contracts, which is that you see the prices, and then you can actually imply these intensities, lambda and mu, from the, the betting contracts, in fact. So there is like a reverse picture, which lambda and mu makes these prices to be exactly uh, where they are. And uh, this could be done, obviously. I uh, I've took uh, an example from a game of Arsenal-Chelsea, which ended up 0-0 played on April 21, uh, 2012. And the thing is that this is time in the game. Well, this is actually a real time, uh, but starting from zero. And uh, Arsenal is expected to score maybe 1.7 uh, goals in the very beginning. And Chelsea is expected to score one. This is what the market believes. And now these intensities are gradually going down. They are almost going down linearly, so it actually uh, suggests that there is a set, uh, there is an initial uh, opinion about the market, and then the the probability that uh, you see a goal is proportional to the time left in the game. Uh, there is uh, a period of a break between the two halves, and uh, the thing is technically nothing is happening on the field, but the market doesn't stop, so you can still you know somehow. Uh, uh, you know, there is, there is still ongoing opinion so, about this. This is, all the, this is from the betting market. It's yes, this is from the betting market. market. market going on while the game is yes, there. exactly. Yeah, so the important message here is that the betting market trades these uh, uh, contracts in play. So, in fact, you can, at any time in the game, you can place uh, a betting, uh, a bet. Okay, so, so obviously there is a, a, per, a period of the break, but you see it's reasonably constant. You know, some, some, you know maybe it's not really decreasing uh, as, uh, uh, at the constant speed, but uh, it's reasonably close to it. Now, of course, the natural question here is, well, is the market right? You know, uh, the thing is, if you want to make money, in fact, you want the market to be wrong. Uh, so this is the only way you, you can actually make money. So the, the thing is, well, maybe they got it wrong, right? Or how, you know, if I, w if I were to start here, uh, how do I actually estimate this thing uh, without seeing it from the market? Okay. And that leads to a question of some kind of athletic performance. Is there anything in the game that you watch the game, you count something, and you realize the, the game is over? Um, so, uh, the uh, soccer, in fact, is a difficult sport to predict, to be honest, because uh, if you watch, for instance, tennis, it's kind of even visual obvious that one player is better than the other, and the game is actually will be concluded with no surprises in some sense. But in soccer, this, uh, doesn't, this is really a small Poisson intensity event. And so even a weaker team can, can you know, underdog, can surprise a stronger team uh, in, by, by scoring a, a, some kind of random goal. And there is no way that the, uh, the stronger team comes back. Uh, I've seen many commentators who uh, comment the game and they get it completely wrong meaning they say okay this team is much much better and you know this is they are gonna win it and at the end they don't and uh, so of course the natural question for me who uh, you know I don't really care who wins I just want to know when the win is coming you know and I want to know it in the first half okay so uh, so is there like some kind of advanced statistics that would tell you that, okay, they are doing something, and because of that, uh, I know that the, the game will result. And obviously, this statistics is not obvious, because if this was an obvious point, everybody would know it, okay? 
So uh, it's, for instance, not the possession of the ball. It's not the percentage of it. It's not the number of passes. Okay. So there are many things that you know that you may see visually that a team is keeping the possession, but that's not enough to win the game. Okay. Many examples that this, this is not a significant statistic, in fact. But uh, in the recent past, in fact, it's a very recent past. Uh, there are some data that uh, helped me to uh, analyze this thing, and there are, uh, one of them is uh, from uh, a tracking company or statistical company, Opta. Okay, so Opta uh, published uh, data since 2008 for the English Premiership, which includes a database of 1,900 games. Uh, I also use um, a website which is ESPN F FC uh, that has match reports since 2008 uh, and the, the, the leaks maintain the statistical, uh, a much smaller statistical data though. Uh, for the English Premiership, it's premierleague.com since 2006. It's, this includes 2,700 plus games and there is the Bundesliga since 2009. Uh, it includes 1,250 plus game, and there is tracking. So the the uh, the one interesting thing about German Bundesliga is that they publish tracking data. So it means distance and speed of individual players and the team as cumulative. And uh, what what turned out are the usual suspects actually. When, so when you regress the goals on these athletic performances, what happens is that uh, it spits out top speed in the Bundesliga. It spits out discipline and stoppages. So discipline means somebody is sent out of, if, of the field, so they are playing you know, short with, without a player. Stoppages uh, disrupt the flow of the game, so it means that there are less goals but for both teams. And uh, to my own surprise, uh, there is a statistics on something which is called open crosses. And this is strongly, this is a big minus sign for the impact on goals. Uh, I should say one little uh, thing here in terms of difficulty of studying soccer. And uh, it's that not everything is causal. So for instance, speed, that, you know, speed creates goals. That's probably true, like if you have offense that actually is faster than, this, than the defense, that's actually a certainly an indication that there could be more goals. But it could be also the other way around. It could be that they are losing by a goal and they start to run faster. Okay. So, uh, and the thing is for, statistic, for studying statistical impact, you need direct causality. So it means that if you do this, you will have more of those. And uh, this, I, I guess that this is the limit, at least in soccer, because many things are not really directly causal. Okay. However, the open crossing is causal because th this is a situation which happens. It's a choice of the team if they do it or not. So, so uh, in a I'm in a relatively lucky situation that this uh, seems to be that there is a direct causal effect of crosses on goals. Okay, so there are some facts that I want to tell you about crossing. So definition of a cross, it's an airborne delivery of a ball from the side of the field across to the front of the goal. So th th it means that there, uh, there is a player who is on the side, typically runs with the ball and lifts the ball and the ball flies in the penalty area with the hope of finding his teammate. Uh, an average, um, why it's called actually open cross, um, so crosses are of two types. Open means that the game is not stopped. So it means the ball is in play, uh, as opposed to a situation which is called set play crossing. So set play crossing means that the ball is uh, static. It sits, it's, for instance, during the free kicks or during corner kicks. So there are certain situations when the ball sits, and that's not a part of this. Uh, study, but an average uh, English Premiership uh, Premiership League team makes 18.2 open crosses per game, 
and scores uh, on average 1.33 goals per game. And average Bundesliga team makes 11 open crosses per game and scores 1.45 goals per game. So the thing is that this is actually a good indication that open crossing is to a certain degree a free will of the team. You see, if this kind of, if the game is played in the same way in, Br in Britain or England and in Germany, they should see the same average numbers somehow. But the, the German teams are crossing less and, you know, much less. It's, they are just at the two thirds of, the, uh, of what happens in England. So, the, so there is a huge uh, difference between the two. And uh, my argument somehow is the more crosses you make, the less goals you score. Okay, and yeah, this is true. You know, I kind of don't want to compare the two leagues because it's a little bit tricky to say, you know, they may have different uh, teams, but you see that there is a measurable effect that indeed the German Bundesliga scores more goals. Um, the, in the English Premiership, the, these 18.2 open crosses produce 3.7 good crosses. Good cross is defined that it the ball finds your teammate. So it means it lands on the head or, uh, you know, there is a touch. Uh, that your, your, your player touches it first. Uh, on the other hand, there are 14.5 bad crosses. So it means th these are crosses which are touched by the opposite team. Uh, mostly the goalkeeper just grabs it. Okay. And uh, the, the vast majority of open crosses results in the loss of the possession in a favorable position, obviously. So most of these crosses are just giving up the possession, in fact. Uh, a, a goal is scored per 92 open crosses. The variability among the teams is huge, though. So there are some kind of, uh, you know, there are teams like Manchester United. Manchester United needs 43.8 open crosses to score a goal. But uh, another team, Southampton, needs one more than 100, you know, close to 150 to score a goal. The uh, thing is that there is a strong observational bias. So if you are just a, a TV, you know, if you are just a fan and if you watch TV or if you watch TV highlights, uh, which are the situations when the goals are typically scored, you see the good crosses, okay? So, uh, uh, so it's, it means that you know, you see per every round, you see a few goals that are scored from crossing because, you know, statistically that, that happens. And, but the thing is that they show you good crosses and they, so they show you this one in 92 and they don't show you 91 out of 92 actually. So that's, uh, so you may get uh, a bias. And there is uh, sort of, this is a common knowledge that there's something wrong with it. Uh, so it's not completely that I am the first to bring it up, but there are you know, ongoing discussion among the either football professionals or bloggers that uh, if this is a good idea to start with. But most of these analysis is limited to kind of descriptive statistics. You know, they just count it and you know say, okay, this uh, you know, they do this, the others do that, uh, and there is no serious say. At least uh, nobody did any regression. At least. Okay. Now, uh, why should, do I show you the football pitch, how it looks like? Uh, well, uh, so because th there are two uh, kind of benchmark statistics that I'm using in the, in the following uh, talk. So one thing is that the length of the field, uh, this distance, is, uh, should be 105 meters. And the statistical, the opta, uh, measures goals which are scored from the outside of the box. That's the penal this is the penalty area. So each time they, uh, there is a shot, it's recorded. And if the shot results in goal, it's, it's also recorded. So, the, so each time, so you have a number of uh, goals from the outside of the box. And there is one thing which is kind of interesting. There's uh, uh, something which is called final third. It's an area which is one third from the uh, from the goal line, which is 35 meters. Actually, this is not uh, as, it doesn't appear as a line in the football field, but the grass is cut in such a way that this is visible for those who count it. Uh, so there is, a, uh, so they count how many times uh, a team crosses that line with a possession. Okay. 
So, uh, so I thought that one can measure how many. What is the effective conversion of open crosses? What is the effective conversion of the shots from the outside of the box? And what is the conversion from the cross from from entering the final third? And so this is the graph which actually shows con conversion statistics in terms of the attack. So the blue line, uh, the blue points, are the, you know, represent the conversion rates for uh, teams in terms of the open cross. So uh, as I've told you, the average is somewhere uh, 1 in 92. So this is somewhere you know, close to 1%. So somehow these teams should, you know, like the conversion rate is 1%. And as you see, uh, most of them, most of these bl blue uh, dots are below the violet dots or red dots, which actually uh, measure the conversion of the entry to the final third. So uh, if the team enters the final third, this is the percentage of those entries which result in a goal. Okay. Now, the thing is, you, you have to realize that most of these entries are completely innocent. You know, it's just, you know, they may be just going, you know, around, and they may actually can make entries without even attacking the goal. You see, it's a different situation than in uh, hockey. In hockey, you need to enter the final third. Uh, you, you, are the attack, you, you, you cannot have any players in the attacking third before entering the, the area. Okay, in soccer, this line is movable. This, is actually, this line is defined by the last or to the second to the last player. So you can actually pass into the final third without being in offside. Okay, so you know, the, 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 this entry can happen by a pass, not just by uh, having the ball. And the uh, green, uh, green points are uh, conversion rates of shots from the, outs from the outside of the box. So you see that if, you, if they decide to shoot, uh, now uh, teams like uh, Manchester United converts uh, every one in, say, uh, 25 shots in a goal. Okay? But this is a much uh, larger variable uh, statistics. And what is interesting is only very few teams are beating the benchmark in terms of entering the final third. And the, the first team, Manchester United, is in fact an outlier, as you see. So they are by far the best, because the next second team is Chelsea, and they are almost to one half of it. You know? like this, this, so so the, the, there is a huge variability in this. At least, well, not variability, but the Manchester United is an outlier. And all these teams are kind of bad. But there, there is one interesting thing which you should notice, is that the teams, uh, the better teams tend to be on the top here. Manchester United, Chelsea, Manchester City, uh, Arsenal, Liverpool. So these are teams that actually are competing for winning the championship. And then there is a team which is uh, Tottenham, okay? And Tottenham is already somehow, you know, they are not as good, in fact. Okay, in this, in this sense. And there is a reason for it, because the stronger teams, they kind of support this game practice. So they, they, they hire players that are athletically capable of uh, producing or converting these crosses. For instance, if you are a taller player, that it has, a, has a certain advantage. So it means that you know, these better teams tend to be more uh, rich, and they tend to buy better players who are able to do th this kind of uh, job. Now, the, there is opposite thing, which is conversion statistics in terms of defense. So what are the teams that are best in terms of defending the open crosses? And on the top, you see Fulham, Manchester City, and so on. Uh, so this uh, order is kind of less, uh, you know, the, the top teams are not really uh, lining up on the top. And the reason is that the there are no special defense players against open crosses. So it means that you know, if you are like a team like Manchester United, you defend everything and not just open crosses. So there's no reason why the statistics of the open, you know, of the open crosses is somehow particularly better. But uh, there is one thing which is one of the top teams, Tottenham, is really sitting in the bottom of this uh, graph. So it's kind of good to cross against Tottenham. 
Okay, well, there are some kind of concerns. So the thing is that uh, in order to convince so uh, football or soccer professionals, better say, uh, the, the fact that the ball results in a, in a bad cross doesn't mean that it's the end of the game because you know, it may rebound and they may actually get the possession back and maybe score later on. So there is a, like a follow-up uh, play. Uh, but the other thing is that if you choose to cross, then you are kind of giving up on the other alternatives. Other alternatives means uh, playing it more to the center on the ground. And uh, if I do the, if I regress actually goals on open crosses, uh, it's taken care into. Because, you know, goals can be produced by open cross indirectly, in fact. So if there is a positive impact, it's actually getting counted in. Okay? If there, is, if there is a negative impact, it's also counted in. And uh, so what, what I do is, well, this is good because uh, I'm in this, you know, kind of among statisticians. I'm not really, uh, don't consider myself a, a statistician, but I kind of know what I'm going, doing. So the, uh, <laughs> uh, no, so, uh, so this is, obviously, uh, I have a lot of data. And now I want to pull them according to the teams, right? Because the teams may be variable in the terms of the quality of attack and variable in terms of the def defense, okay? So th there are two ways how I can group them, according to the attack, according to the defense. And this leads to something which is called known cross-sectional model. So it means that you have groups, uh, but there are two different groupings. You know, like, uh, for instance, if I play, if there is Arsenal playing Chelsea, Arsenal sits as an attack team, uh, Chelsea sits as a defense. But in the same game, Chelsea is also attacking and Arsenal is also defending. So I have these two groups here. And what I do is I want to explain goals as a Poisson, you know, it's, it's a result of a Poisson, which has three parameters. There is some kind of intercept. Okay, so it means there is some kind of, you know, league level of scoring these goals. There is an effect of home field advantage, so this actually is beta uh, H. And now the thing is there is a coefficient which, which sits with the cross. Okay, so, you know, this is the estimated uh, impact of, so, uh, so this beta I is the league average of the intercept, the Beta H is the league average of the home team advantage. This beta C is the league average of the quality of the cross impact on the goals. And then what I allow is variability according to the attack, which is U, and according to the defense, which is V. Okay, and I do allow for variability of the intercept, and I allow for variability of the cross, I just don't allow for variability in the home because this turns out to be as sort of not insignificant, but the, the number is more or less the same for all the, uh, all the teams. So there is no need to actually make it too variable. And uh, what is expected is that this variability of these coefficients is normally distributed, okay. which is a bit sort of restrictive because as you saw, the Manchester United is probably an outlier beyond normality. Okay. Uh, so this is what happens. Okay? So when you run it on the EPL, there is an intercept. You have to realize that there is, it's, it's actually expo it sits in the exponential. It's not a linear uh, regression. It's Poisson. So I'm estimating the E to linear. So these are coefficients which sit in the E to this. So the inter uh, intercept is here. Home advantage is this, and the open cross is minus 0 0.022. So uh, technically speaking, I am each cross costs you on average uh, more than two percent of all goals. Uh, you, this, this is like scaling, uh, you know, because this this is exponential model, so it means that everything is scalable. You know, it's it's not linear, but this this costs you. 2%, you know, maybe 2.3%. Uh, these are information criteria, a number of observations. There are, there are 29 groups. Now, as you see, this is beyond all any significance because the coefficient should be, you know, the confidence interval is pr pretty much two standard deviations away. And this is the standard deviation, so I'm somewhere between uh, one point 
1.6 to 2.8, minus 1.6%, you know, zero. So I'm significantly away from zero. So this is beyond any doubt that this is a bad idea to cross. And then th this is a variability of the coefficients. So the coefficients of the intercepts are varying, uh, you know, in the terms of uh, attack and in terms of the defense. Uh, so I better show you the individual coefficients. And so this is for uh, the kind of two uh, top 17 teams. I just uh, crossed out the teams which were either relegated in the past, so they disappear from the league or they were recently promoted. So I have these uh, kind of uh, traditional teams. And as you see, there is one interesting pattern. The stronger is the team, the worse is the coefficient. So Arsenal is about, Arsenal is a strong team, 0 0.03. Chelsea is a strong team. Liverpool is a strong team. Manchester United is a strong, uh, Manchester City is a strong team. Um, Manchester United has a small coefficient, but that's not surprising because it's a superior crossing team. Okay, so, uh, so actually, the, the, I'm kind of glad that these statistics actually caught this ability to, uh, of, of beneficial crossing for Manchester United, but, the, but Tottenham is, uh, is absolutely bad, you know, that's, uh, it's, 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 it's 4% actually. Um, uh, so, so this is an interesting pattern, and it has an explanation, in fact. So the explanation is, that we are talking about luck versus skill. So aerial delivery is hugely random. So it means that it cannot be you know, sufficiently repeated. You know, may, uh, effectively, most of these goals can be attributed to some luck. Okay? And uh, the thing is, if they don't cross, they can actually play on the ground. And then the skill actually may appear. They are faster. They probably have a better control of the ball. They can dribble. And the thing is, these opportunities are missed by this crossing. And the better is the team, the more of these opportunities actually are you know, forfeited. So this is not uh, a surprise here, I would say. In terms of the defense, uh, you know, the defense is not that kind of uh, you know, it has some variability, but you see where are the big numbers. The big numbers are usually in the teams which are not competing for the top. Norwich, uh, Newcastle, Southampton. Here in the bottom is West Bromwich or West Ham. So, so, so the thing is, if you are a strong team, it's a really sp uh, stupid idea to cross against a weak team. Because you can overplay them on the ground. And this is visible from these coefficients. However, if you play against, I don't know, uh, Manchester United, it probably doesn't matter if you pass it on the ground or shoot it in the air. OK? All right. Uh, I did the same thing for Bundesliga. And as you see, the number is also uh, similar. It's actually 2. You know, it's 2%. So this is a similar impact. Uh, as I've told you, they have much smaller average to start with. Uh, so, uh, so, so is this story same here? Well, so the story is, well, as you see, there are two top teams. One is uh, Munich, Bayern Munich, it sits here. And there is Borussia Dortmund, which is another data, by the way, two finalists on the Championship League in the last year. So actually, that means that these are two best you know, European teams in, 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 in this uh, term. Uh, in this, in, and as you see, Borussia Dortmund has the worst coefficient here among all these teams. So it means that the, the, they are most suffering from, from this fact of open crossing. Uh, the Bayern Munich is not that bad, but it probably means that I don't have a conversion statistics for Bundesliga, but I suspect that they actually score a, a decent significant number out of crosses, so it doesn't actually kill them uh, that badly. In terms of the defense, as you see, uh, teams that are not top teams are actually have uh, worse coefficients. So uh, Hanover, uh, Werder Bremen, Wolfsburg and stuff. Uh, and guess what? Bayern Munich has a positive coefficient. You know, it's quite close to zero, but what does it mean? Well, uh, it's a holiday when a team scores against Bayern Munich. They probably let maybe 10 goals per season or something. And so it means that it really doesn't matter if you try to score it on the ground or shoot it in the air. 
And so uh, that, that's the story. So I'm kind of, I'm glad that, you know, these numbers are picking some, some message here. Okay, so as I've told you, they are negative, but the thing is they are still at most neutral. So there's nothing which would say this is a good idea. Okay, uh, as I've told you, the, the, my, my impression is that the stronger attacking teams tend to have more negative impact on scoring than weaker teams, with a single exception of Manchester United. And this is the, due to the fact that aerial delivery of the ball has less precision and thus has more luck than skill involved. Uh, stronger teams benefit more from situations that depend on scale in contrast to situations that depend on luck. Okay? The negative impact on scoring is more visible for weaker defending teams and it may be neutral against strong teams such as Bayern Munich. And uh, one thing which is uh, similar in this picture is that other things which depend on, which have less precision in, in uh, soccer, uh, they tend to have the same impact. So for instance, less precisions are long balls and less precisions are corners that are played inside the, the, the box. So, if, uh, so this, they, th this is the same type of story. Mm -hmm. And I show you some of these graphs that are not kind of completely outrageously lying here uh, with statistics. So the thing is that as you see, uh, if, if I just plot the open cross on goals uh, as, he, as points, uh, I try to jitter these uh, points so they actually don't lie on each other when they happen to be, uh, you know, have the same value. Uh, and uh, this is the average number of cross, uh, crosses home, this is average number of crosses away, this is average number of goals home, and this is average number of cross, uh, goals away. And these are the two, uh, the, the red line is the projected, it's the best fit for the data. You know, for these, the, the data is now the Poisson intensity, okay? It's not the, the goals, it's the Poisson intensity. And as you see, I'm kind of doing a decent job. This is believable. There is one thing, which is if you are Tottenham, and if I'm counting your open crosses, once I, once I get to, I don't know, 18, and if you are playing away, there will be no more than three goals. You see, there, there's absence of data here, okay? So it means once you go into critical number of crosses, there you will, see, you will not see many goals, okay? The, uh, so this, the, here is your prediction for the game. Uh, Arsenal is, is here. You can, there is one thing which you can argue, is that this intercept, uh, the difference between this point and that point is the projected improvement of the scoring, okay? I mean, it's a little bit too outrageous because it's exponential and maybe it actually goes and, you know, puts a little bit more twist to the left, so it's more than realistic, but, uh, you know, you can actually somehow in, a, in, a, in an extreme say, well, you know, I, if, if you just stopped crossing, this is what I would expect you to score how many goals, okay? So these, you know, Arsenal can score four goals at home if they just stopped crossing. Uh, Manchester United here, as you see, they are almost uniformly distributed points here. You see, so these, po uh, uh, I want to show you the contrast. Okay, so Tottenham has absence of these points here. Uh, Manchester United does not. Okay, so they have points here, and so it means that the crossing is really neutral to them. Uh, I estimate this, this slope negative, but it may not be negative because there's a mean reversion to the, uh, you know, I'm, I, can't, I don't allow for too big difference from these uh, uh, coefficients estimated from the global data. Okay, Chelsea, bad. Liverpool, bad. Uh, Manchester City, bad. Stoke City, a weak team. I mean, I don't, I don't want to offend the, their uh, fans, but uh, the, the average number of goals they score is about one, and so that's not like uh, Chelsea, for instance, uh, and the, the effect is almost neutral, in fact, as, as you see. Uh, Bayern Munich, so this is German Bundesliga, this is uh, sloping down, Borussia Dortmund, bet. and Werder Bremen, a, a weaker team, it doesn't matter too much. In terms of defense, as you see, if, if they are playing, that means if you are playing against these teams. Well, it's not really strong, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, 
It, it probably doesn't matter if you cross or not against Manchester United. You know, this is neutral. Tottenham, well, slightly negative. Arsenal, slightly negative. Chelsea, slightly negative. Liverpool, slightly negative. Manchester City. But West Bromwich, a weaker team, okay, you see the difference. You shouldn't cross against West Bromwich. Okay, Bayern Munich, well, you can cross against Bayern Munich. That's not a bad idea. Uh, Borussia Dortmund, you can cross against Borussia Dortmund. Werder Bremen, no, it's a bad idea. Okay, so is, is, crossing, is crossing that? Well, no. But, you know, it should be used only by weaker teams playing against stronger teams when the luck plays more, a more important role or the stronger teams must improve the crossing quality to the point of uh, Manchester United to make it at most neutral. And uh, this would need a big improvement, by the way, because the second best crossing teams need 62.6 open crosses per goal. At the present times, the teams seem to overuse open crossing, and the reduction obviously can increase scoring for most of the teams. Some top teams can score 40 plus goals per season by reducing crossing. And that's about how many goals scores Messi in his top season, okay? So if they just stop doing it, you know, for instance, Tottenham would be a clear winner in the Premier League, okay? All right? And they don't need to, yeah, they just need to hire me, you know? <laughs> so the thing is, you know, what if we see that? You know, so yeah, actually, you know, send me a check, you know, I, uh, I, I you know, like, I, I, I'll settle for half of his salary. If you win the championship, I'm okay with half of his salary. I don't need the golden shoe for the best score, actually, so it's, you can keep it. Uh, and uh, if you are interested more in this, so I, I actually post uh, my papers on SSRN, so you can check it out. Uh, I still need to you know, somehow polish this thing. But you know, once it's done, it it's, will be there. There is an older version that uses standard linear regression. Uh, so if something is there. Conclusions are really much the same. So thank you. So uh, we're going to take a break until about 11:35. There's coffee uh, up near the registration desk. Thank you. Sir. If you have any questions for Jan, please ask him there. I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions. <laughs>